Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with everyone. I think this is going to be a great discussion. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A right now so that when we get to that, we can assist. Today, we will be having a really important conversation in honor of you know, racial justice and health equity. Um, and Juneteenth is coming right up on um, Monday. So before we get started, I do want to let everyone know that this is actually going to be Indo Black's last virtual event. We are so excited to have done this for several years now since 2022, no, since 2020 when we originally started this, um, in an effort to support women who were uh, struggling while the pandemic was happening. Um, we've had conversations about relationships, sex, mental health, endo diet, and we're just so excited to have done this with so many people. Thank you, especially to Elizabeth, who has been an amazing uh, MC and host when we do our events, as well as Erica Williams, Ariel Barnes, and so many others. Um, so again, thank you so much. And we can go ahead and get started. I would like to introduce you to Elizabeth Smith for those who do not know her. Here she is. Hey, Liz. Hey. So happy to be here. Every time I'm with you guys, I feel like, okay, I'm home with my sisters. I'm in a safe space. So always thank you to you, Lauren, for having me, including me and allowing me to be in this environment and in this space because it's honestly therapeutic for me. Okay. So <laughs> I'm so excited to have this conversation. And um, yeah, if you guys are ready, let's get into it. Alrighty, I'm turning my screen off. <laughs> okay. Alrighty, so I will be joined by some beautiful little island teens who are going to jump on this and we're going to get right into it because as if you don't know, June, um, it's a lot. It's a lot that we celebrate in June, but we also celebrate Caribbean American Heritage Month. And it's what better time than to have this conversation about Indo and its impact on Caribbean people in America. But before we do jump into this conversation, I would love for each of us to introduce ourselves um, and just tell everyone where you come from. And then we're going to get right into the conversation. So as Lauren said, my name is Elizabeth Smith. I go by Liz. I'm a originally from Nashville, Tennessee, but I now live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm a journalist, a host, um, voiceover, actress, uh, executive producer. I do a lot in the industry, um, and I am an endo survivor. And I found out not too long ago, y'all got a little Barbados in this blood, so I'm here, okay? <laughs> but I will pass it off to Natasha after Natasha. The rest of the panelists can introduce themselves, and then we get right into the questions. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Natasha. Um, I, I come from a Jamaican family. Um, my mom is Jamaican and my dad is from St. Lucia. Um, I'm actually from Canada. I'm out here in Los Angeles. Uh, well, I've moved to Los Angeles for work. I'm a travel nurse. I work in the ICU. Um, I graduated back in 2018. Um, and yeah, I've been working in the ICU for about three and a half years. Um, I am an endo queen as well. Um, I've been suffering with uh, endometriosis for about uh, maybe 15 years. Um, I um, have stage four. It's very, very bad. Um, it has um, collapsed my lung. Uh, maybe three times back in 2017. So that was a very rough year for me. Um, and um, I'm doing a lot better. I'm actually, I was in remission and then I had a flare up maybe about three weeks ago. So I've been dealing with that on and off. Um, my pain has actually come back. So I go back and I see my doctor um, in Canada in about uh, two weeks or so. Um, so yeah, I've been managing my diet, I've been going to the gym, and that has seemed to have helped me with my endometriosis symptoms. 
Um, I, I am also the CEO and founder of Katasha, which is a, um, a jewelry line, a gold um, statement piece jewelry line that I started in honor of my sister-in-law who passed away back in 2020. Um, she didn't have endometriosis, but she did have fibroids. And unfortunately, the medication that she was um, taking for her fibroids took her life um, back in 2020. Um, so I did decide that I was going to start a jewelry line in her honor because she did love jewelry. Um, basically, my brand is about, you know, helping out my sisters, you know, so I know that endometriosis, especially for me, has been very expensive. You know, I've taken countless times off work. I've had so much surgery. Um, I am, I would like to be a mother one day. And I know how IVF can be very expensive and medications can be expensive. So every jewelry sold, part of the proceeds um, will go towards a family, a couple, um, one of my sisters that needs help with surgery or IVF. Um, so that's one of my, that's one of the things that I would like to take my brand to um, in the future. Love it. Okay, Miss Melanie. Hey everyone. So I'm Melanie. I am actually from Trinidad. I was born there, um, family from there. I moved to the U.S. when I was seven and I'd grown up in Silver Spring. Um, so downtown Silver Spring, Maryland is like where I've grown up. Um, so I always had like bad cycles. I got my first cycle when I was nine. Um, they've always been bad, but I was not officially diagnosed with endometriosis until 2020 when I had a ruptured cyst. Um, so I've had, and the doctor was very casual. Oh, this looks like it could be endometriosis and left it at that. Couldn't get another appointment, nothing. Um, I had a botch surgery last year and I am having a proper endo excision next week, actually. <laughs> so, um, really just navigating this space. I was in corporate America for 10 years. I worked in corporate treasury, um, and kind of got tired of it and became a flight attendant. So I am a flight attendant, um, which the schedule is very flexible for me, which I find that I need with endo. Um, and I also am a loctician. I love it. I love it. Most fascinating. Yes. And last but not least, Miss Julia. Hi, everyone. Um, Julia Mandeville. I am from Barbados. I moved to the U.S. in 2019. Um, so still very, very new to navigating healthcare and all of the systems um, in this country. Um, I moved to Virginia. So I am actually in the DMV. Um, I was originally in Fairfax and I'm in Woodbridge. So pretty close to Silver Spring. Um, I was diagnosed with endo in 2014. Um, and this is after about 15 years or so. Of dealing with um, the debilitating pelvic pain. Um, at that time, I also was in the process of getting my master's in public health, and I was going to go into communicable disease control because my background is microbiology with biology. But my endo diagnosis caused me to change course um, after I recognized how limited the information was in terms of endometriosis in Black women and endometriosis in the Caribbean. And so in 2016, I co-founded the Barbados Association of Endometriosis and PCOS. And yeah, that's been a whole chunk of the work that I've been doing since. Um, we have several arms, research, advocacy, support, um, education. Um, and so even though I've moved to the US, I still help as much as I could with the technical um, aspect. Um, I currently am pursuing my PhD in public health um, at the George Mason University. And I am focusing a lot of my research um, on women's health, specifically black women's health. 
and currently have several ongoing projects um, trying to understand endometriosis in Black populations. So yeah, so that's me. I love it. So as you can see, we have so many different backgrounds of women who um, experience this, this, this disease that has brought us all together. And, you know, as being American and having this disease and having to deal with it for so many years, um, I, I believe my 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 uh, cycle probably started like around 10 and my symptoms started literally at 10. But I honestly didn't get diagnosed until about 26. So it took a lot of years. It took a lot of time and patience and advocating. My first surgery was botched, which where they removed my left ovary and my left fallopian tube, unfortunately. And after that, that's when I was able to get the help that I really needed to deal with this disease. But for you all. Um, and, and coming up in my family, we didn't understand what this was. We didn't know what it was. No one had any idea of what this was. Okay. We were all confused and we just wanted relief and help for you all. How was women's health viewed in particular to your family in your culture? And how did you receive the help and support from your family when bringing this to their attention that you suffer from this disease that a lot of us have no knowledge and idea about and anyone can answer, um, just go at it. Um, I can start. So for me, health has been always a, a like a paramount area within my family. Um, however, my parents had no idea what this condition was. And so for years, so like you, I also got my period around between 10 and 11. And you know originally it was like you know your first couple will hurt and then it should get better and it never got better and I think they thought I was exaggerating um and I really like looking back I couldn't blame them because they didn't know what this was I remember uh, right after my surgery and I was out and I was having a conversation with my mother and the doctor confirmed it was endometriosis she was like well this is really the very first time I'm hearing about this condition and she looked defeated. She looked like, how was it that there was a name for what my daughter was going through? Um, I would say that because of what I assume um, is because of how the medical literature had described endometriosis, particularly with the quote unquote, not typically found in black women and Barbados is like over 90% black. I think that may have had a huge role to play in that delay in diagnosis, um, simply because it was not an, like on the index of suspicion for the medical practitioners I was going to. I kept getting like, like so for Barbados, um, our, our healthcare system is a little different. Um, so I was able to see practitioners and they would always like write just dysmenorrhea, just dysmenorrhea. You need some time off dysmenorrhea. And it was only after I was doing my own research, I recognized, well, there are two types of dysmenorrhea and you never like explain that to me because I figured like if you would have gone into more detail, I would have maybe done my own research if needed and, you know, figured out it could have been either endo or something else, but because of just that lack of awareness at that point in time, I think that's definitely what contributed to the delay in diagnosis, but it wasn't a case of my parents not caring about health. It's just, they thought it was normal. Um, I guess I can go next. Um, so yeah, I got my period maybe uh, around 11, 12. Um, and uh, it was when I started getting a lot of pain, um, my mom and my dad didn't really recognize, you know, that this wasn't normal. Um, they thought it was the norm for them, especially, you know, speaking with my mom and stuff and going through the pains for four or five days. Um, she would, uh, just tell me, you know, to take some Advil or some Tylenol or, um, coming from a Jamaican family, they're big on tea, <laughs> drink some tea, <laughs> um, which didn't really help actually. Well, when I was in, um, 
I would go back and forth to Jamaica very, very often, especially um, around Christmas time. We would go when I was much younger. Um, and there was a couple of times where, um, you know, I did get my period when I was down there. And my my grandfather, he gave me something called a bush tea called dog blood. And it took my pain away right away. But it was only it was only temporary, you know, like even after uh, a couple of hours or so, I would have had to have drinking that tea again. But, um, you know, my family or my culture is big on tea. They think that that is the cure for anything. You vomit, you know, you have a headache, go drink some tea. <laughs> so um, that went on for years and years and years until um, my endometriosis started to attack my bladder. And every time I would have a period, um, I, I would go to the bathroom to urinate and I would be in excruciating pain. One day I had such a big flare um, that they had to take me to the hospital to uh, get my pain under control. And at that time, um, I didn't, we didn't know that I had endometriosis. I had to go and get um, uh, uh, a test. They had to put a, uh, a tube um, into my, I'm sorry, I'm a nurse, so I don't want to use medical jargon where you guys don't understand, but they had to basically put a camera up my urethra to see what was going on and they could see all these big tumors. Um, and they took a sample of it and, um, they were think I was thinking that it was cancer at that time, but they went and they um, recommend me to um, go have surgery. I had surgery, it was a botched surgery as well. And um, when they tested it, that's when it came back as an endometrial tissue. So I was, um, I was uh, referred to a specialist um, back, back home. Um, but it was, you know, before I had that surgery, um, it was not common in my family. There, were, there is a lot of women, especially um, when I would go back home to, to Jamaica, there was a lot of my cousins and stuff like that that had really bad periods. I actually can remember that one of my cousins ended up passing out, um, which isn't normal, um, which is not normal. I know that now, but to them, it was normal. And it's just, um, it's pretty sad to how they're not, I, I feel like it's not really educated out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, I got my first period at nine. And I, I remember like it was yesterday, like my aunt had to come pick me up. Like pain was so bad, y'all. I used to crawl under the dining room table and just ball up whenever I would get it. And then as I started getting older, um, I would feel my ovulation. So now I'm in pain two weeks out of the month instead of one. And same thing, drink some tea. You have your tea this morning, like, and I'm like, girl, what? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I think for my family, like they just really didn't understand. They just thought that I was just having bad period after bad period. Um, it wasn't until really until I had that ruptured cyst that things for my health kind of just took a turn for the worse. And now it was like constant pain and just constant like agony. And everything is like trying to figure out what's going on. And my mom is very holistic. So she's like, you need to do this herbal cleanse and it'll heal your body. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but um, it's, I think that now, so two months ago, I had such a bad flare, I couldn't even get out of the bed. My mom came over and she was like, I'm calling 911. And I was like, they're not going to do anything. Like, don't, it, don't waste my time or my money. Right. But she called anyways. And <laughs> same, so said, so done. Nothing happened. But that was where she truly saw how agonizing the pain was for me. And where she was just like, okay, like something is wrong with you. And so now she's on this kick of, you need to go home and get the woman to fix your womb. I found this old lady down there who can fix your womb and turn it around. And, and I'm just like, and then what? Yeah. So I think that for, for my family personally, it's just a matter of understanding. And with my sister, like I find these videos and I, and I send them to her and she actually like, interprets it as to what I'm going through 
And she's just like, you know, I'm sorry that you're in all of this pain. Like, I wish I could take it away from you. Um, but yeah, my mom is just, she's so special because she really just thinks some tea and some herbs is going to just cure all. And, you know, staying on that topic and speaking of that, I mean, it sounds like even though we all come from different backgrounds, it's just the the root and the base is just not being educated and not being informed enough and knowing what is going on and us being first from our families who are experiencing this and advocating for the fact that we need help and that like, you know, this isn't normal, you know, there, there are issues. But do you think there are there are any cultural or other societal factors within the Caribbean culture that contribute to delayed diagnosis or misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis of endometriosis? Um, so I think again, in terms of medical, the medical system, just how endometriosis was characterized, but additionally. Um, endometriosis, there, there seems to be some association with endometriosis and fibroids that is still being investigated and because there's a high proportion of people that have fibroids that also have endometriosis and because endometriosis, sorry, because fibroids is so prevalent in the Black population, I think more often than not, if there's that pain associated with menstruation, more often than not, people will think it might be uterine fibroids before they think it's endometriosis, um, both within potentially maybe within the clinical setting as well as as home. Um, and then I think in terms of the Caribbean broadly, because there's this notion that uh, black black people are very fertile, a condition that may impede that doesn't make sense in our in our setting. And so it also leads to black women dealing seeking treatment for fertility issues um, because of that cultural notion like it, it can't I'm supposed to be able to have a child, I'm supposed to be able to carry. So some we we just need to figure this out at, like on our own. Um, so I think in terms of like Caribbean culture, I think the fertility myth is one thing that probably also contributes to that delay in diagnosis as well as high prevalence of fibroids and then pain being attributed to that as opposed to endometriosis. Right, right, right. Totally can see that. I also think that the healthcare system, um, I can, I haven't visited St. Lucia yet, but like I said, I've been to Jamaica plenty of times since I've been young. Um, and even though I wasn't admitted to any of the hospitals out there in um, Jamaica, um, I've had plenty of family members that have, and um, a lot of them are afraid to go to the doctor, especially the women. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather, he didn't like going to the hospital. My grandmother didn't like going to the hospital, um, especially if you came from like a poor class family. Um, the hospitals weren't in the greatest condition. So I feel like a lot of the times, um, you know, if there was a younger female that was having a flare or in a lot of pain, it's just something that they would deal with, you know, even though that, that is not normal. Um, but I do think that the healthcare system, the poor healthcare system, um, has a lot to do with it as well. Definitely understandable. And, you know, speaking, staying on the topic of healthcare, how do you think healthcare professionals and organizations can better support Caribbean individuals with endometriosis, including raising awareness, improving diagnosis, and providing culturally sensitive care? Like, what does that look like? This is in the U.S. or both in the U.S. and in the Caribbean? Honestly, I would say mostly in the Caribbean. Um, well, I can say that, so since I I literally just left Barbados, um, we do 
have a lot of entities in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Barbados, in St. Lucia, um, really advocating to uh, raise awareness within the communities, as well as work with medical practitioners. And so we have had conferences um, for uh, continuing medical education credits to encourage doctors to attend and introduce them to what I guess for them would be novel approaches, um, new information. A lot of the times I've been told by medical practitioners I'm aware of that, you know, they've learned more about endometriosis because of our conferences, because it's not something that's typically taught in their curriculum. And so that is one thing we're pushing for to, in, to have more information about endometriosis and other um, conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome um, included in the curriculum so that, you know, again, index of suspicion is raised when a patient approaches you with pelvic pain. Um, and so it's just to work with, there are people on the ground doing the work. I can completely guarantee that. So it's just to listen, but I also know that there's so, there's so many constraints in terms of human resources. Um, it's just to kind of find that little sweet spot, that, that area where the patient and the practitioner can get together and develop a plan for themselves individually and as well as the advocacy organizations and the medical organizations to also work together to develop some sort of guidelines or policies but people are on the ground doing the work in the Caribbean for sure that's good to know anyone else Well, with you saying that, how do you think that the Caribbean community in America can come together to support individuals with endometriosis and raise awareness about the condition? Because while it's still not the best here in America, I feel like we have a little bit more progress and a little bit more awareness. So what does that bridge look like, you know, to to help our people um, in the Caribbeans who are experiencing this and who don't have the same type of resources as us? I say it's things like this, right? Like organizations like Indo Black bringing people together, holding webinars, holding conferences um, to educate us all more on the conditions as things are growing, things are learning, we're e learning and evolving, but just really banding together as a sisterhood and reaching out and seeking understanding and joining organizations or trying to go to different events where you can learn more and really understand more so that you're able to better advocate for yourself or your sister. Very true. So for, uh, because I'm pretty sure right now, and, and Julia, did you want to say anything before? Um, I was just going to, I guess, piggyback off of what Melanie was saying in terms of um, working with people in the Caribbean, from the Caribbean in the US and also just remembering, and I don't think I answered that part in your previous question, the cultural competency part, um, because there is a space for these whole holistic um, approaches, um, even, even if it's a case of it just being a source of comfort. Um, and it's not going to do any harm. Like the, the T's, you know, the T's might not necessarily, they're not going to get rid of the endometriosis and they're not going to completely um, remove the pain, but it is a source of comfort. And for some, for some people, particularly like our, our parents and our grandparents, that is their way of showing support because they might, again, they're not necessarily going to understand the medical jargon. They definitely don't understand what's happening in our body, but just recognizing that cultural component is so critical for that social support and you know if a Caribbean person comes to a doctor in the U.S. and and they talk about these teas don't be disparaging right just recognize that this is part of your culture and and say well how and and try to find out more about it and see if there is a way to incorporate that in in you know the intervention moving forward if it if it is working for that individual and there are other there are other approaches that are that come down from our grandparents 
um, just yesterday was telling someone, you know, put a the hot water compress and they never heard about that. And they're they're like they're living in the region and they never heard about that. And so just making sure that we're sensitive to other approaches that might not necessarily be quote unquote clinical or medical, but can also be a source of comfort. That's good. That's a good one. Yeah. Now, um, at this point in time, I'm pretty sure there are some young ladies and whether it's Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, who are experiencing everything that we've already been through and everything that we currently go through. And, you know, hopefully they can see this video and this conversation one day. But when they do, what is some type of um advice you would give to them about advocating for themselves whether they um have the resources or not like you know if you could go back in time to that young girl who was experiencing the pain that we all know so well what is some advice you would give to that young lady about seeking the help that she needs and advocating for herself um I would say you know speak up um for yourself if the doctor is telling you one thing and it just doesn't match or make sense um always going and maybe seeking professional help from somewhere else because that's what I had to do like when I started feeling um pain in my bladder or in my pelvic area every time I got my period for one whole year my doctor had me on antibiotics for UTI and I said you know after like 10 or 11 months I said this is a UTI for one whole friggin' year like no you need to send me to go and see somebody else this does not make any sense come on now a UTI for one whole year and then that's when um when I really pushed that um that's when she sent me to go and see a urologist and then that's when they had to you know put the camera up there and see that they could see all these different tumors and then the surgery and all that. Like if I didn't, if I didn't stand up for myself, um, it, I don't think I would have gotten very far, you know, with, with my doctor. And, you know, also um, I, it, it happened again back in 2017 when my, when my lung collapsed the first time and I was looking it up, I knew I had endometriosis at the time. Um, but when I was looking it up, I found out that endo, you know, that's when I was learning that endo is like a full body thing. It's not only reproductive, you know, so it growing on my lung is, is they were saying that it was rare and I'm like, well, maybe I'm one of the rare cases and they didn't listen to me. They didn't listen to me. They stuck a, a chest tube into my side, reinflated my lung. Once it was reinflated, they sent me back home. Mm -hmm. And then not even a month later, the lung collapses again. <laughs> I, the lung collapses again. And I was in the hospital again. And I was neglected. I felt like I was neglected. Mm -hmm. I felt like they didn't listen to me. And I had to, the second time I went back, the thoracic doctor that I saw, I told him, I don't want you to be part of my care. You need to send me somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the, the second thoracic doctor that came in and saw me took me seriously. He took me seriously and I went and I had surgery. And then that's when they found like five centimeters of endometrial tissue growing on my diaphragm. Mm. yeah so I feel like I feel like you know not only for like you know the Caribbean culture especially because we're women of color um which is an issue with it with the doctors taking us seriously I feel like you really need to speak up for yourself like if you're not getting the answers from one doctor next okay bye I'm going to go see somebody else, you know? So, I mean, that's some advice that I, I could give as well, you know? Right. Right. Agree. I would say a couple of things. First, once you notice like your pain is bad or things are starting to be abnormal for you, keep a journal, 
like, or keep a notepad in your phone, like, and just really document what you're going through and what you're experiencing. Also write down your questions. Like if you feel something that is completely left field, you may ask like a parent or a sibling and they have no clue what you're talking about, write it down, take it to your doctors. If you, you're seeing a doctor and you're not getting the answers that you need, or you feel like you're not being hurt, find another one and another one. Like you have to do the research to find the doctors who are gonna truly listen and work with you for your care. At the end of the day, it's your body and you know when something is wrong and advocating for yourself is a very big part of it in, in all cultures, especially as black women, right? Um, and finding the doctors who are educated enough and who don't just say one thing and do something else, but really finding doctors who understand this disease um, and who are continuously evolving and learning because it's growing every day, right? Things are changing. So really just journaling, documenting your questions, asking your questions and getting the answers to your questions too, because that's the second part of it. Um, and finding other doctors if you're not comfortable or you're not, if you don't feel like you're getting the care that you need. Yeah. Julia, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think Natasha and Melanie covered everything <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, the advice that you would give young persons. Uh, no, no, nothing to add. Yeah. And definitely documenting, 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 journaling, 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 literally everything. It doesn't matter how big or how small. That is literally the trail to make everything make sense and to show that I am not tripping. Even if you got to put the time, the date, you got to do it. Because if you're not going to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself, who will? And it really will bring you the help that you need. Now, I know we've been talking about a lot of the negatives. But I do want to ask, has anyone here seen any positive steps towards bringing the gap in health equity, whether that's back home or whether that's just here in the United States? And what are some positives that you've seen towards steps bridging the gap in health equity? Um, I feel like that's a loaded question, but... I will, I will say that, okay, so I guess I can start from, um, in Barbados specifically, uh, I, I don't want to speak to the other Caribbean countries because I know this, the context is different, um, but there they are efforts to, again, raise awareness, um, throughout the society. Um, I think because there, there are different levels to this, it's, it's not as apparent <laughs> um, outside of like the policy level. I do know that more patients, female um, patients um, are feeling more equipped to have dialogue with their doctors as opposed to it being a, a monologue where the doctor is just giving them the information. Um, they're doing everything that Melanie and, and Natasha mentioned on the individual level, making notes, having another advocate there for them, um, and you know, really pushing for that recognition of um, equal ownership in that process in terms of their healthcare. Um, in terms of the US, um, I can say that we currently have, in my capacity as a PhD student, currently have uh, several projects ongoing, two of which are in association with Endo Black, um, and really trying to understand those barriers and facilitators to healthcare for Black women with endometriosis. And hopefully that the information that comes from those studies can be integrated into policies and recommendations because there are a lot of there are a lot of processes moving forward. But my concern is are the unique experiences of Black women with endometriosis being considered when you are moving processes forward in terms of endometriosis care and and 
and diagnosis. Um, and so that is what we I we are doing um, back home as well as um, here in the U.S. I it's 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 difficult because um, sometimes a lot of the a lot of the changes can be very surface level. So I I prefer to speak more to things that are very policy oriented because hopefully with the policy you get that real substantive change. Um, but that's that's just my opinion. Gotcha. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I do want to ask, um, well, one, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box so that we can answer them before we wrap up because we're about to wrap up pretty soon. So if you have any questions, no question is a dumb question. If you got a question, put it in there. We'll be sure to answer it um, before we wrap up. But um, for you ladies, what obstacles do you feel stand in the way of racial justice? And what do you think we can do to improve them? Because yeah, we're talking about our problems. We're trying to, you know, be a safe space and it's a form of therapy and it's also a form of uh, seeking advice and improvement. Um, but we also want to be able to think about solutions in a way that we can fix this for the generation coming up after us. So what obstacles do you feel stand in the way of racial justice? And what do you think we can do individually together to improve them? is a hard question <laughs> <laughs> we gotta we gotta we gotta do it ladies because i mean i do not want my daughter to be going through this mess <laughs> Just i don't know up. maybe i don't know i i what we're doing now you know i think what lauren is doing is absolutely amazing i was she was actually one of the her the endo black was one of the first groups that i was even aware of you know because um, there's actually none out there that I could even think of no other, um, support group that, you know, um, caters to black women out there. So I was absolutely happy. I was very, very happy when I found this group because I felt so alone, you know, and I feel like I don't know. I just feel like education is key, you know, bringing awareness, having these social groups hopefully will help fill this gap that's happening, you know, um, cause I don't want to see my daughters go through this. I don't want, um, I actually don't want what happened to my sister to happen to anybody else because her situation was very unfortunate. And I feel like she was neglected as well. Her doctors neglected her as a Black woman, um, which could have been prevented. She could have been here. She could have been here with her two kids. She could have been here with her grandchildren, and she's not, you know, so. Yeah, education, for sure. Anyone else? I think I, I really just agree with the education piece of it. Um, and just speaking from my personal experience, all of my doctors have been Black. The mm -hmm. one who truly has taken an interest in my case and really is working to care for me is Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me personally, I feel like my Black doctors have kind of just brushed it under the rug or like they think they know what they're doing and they just do whatever um, without the full understanding of the scope of what endometriosis is. Um, and then I also have adenomyosis. And so when I did, when I was doctor shopping, um, I saw a white male doctor and y'all know the first cure for that is to have a hysterectomy. So I think that what, what Lauren is doing, what Indo Black is doing, what a lot of these other organizations are doing are pushing for education and awareness and policy changes um, and understanding. And those are the things that we have to continue pushing for and continue moving forward and continue to evolve. I think that, and I'm not in the, the medical space, however, I do believe that, you know, doctors need to really do case studies and try to understand what is happening 
with this disease? How is it going wrong? Where are we making the wrong turns? And how can we really um, move forward from that? How can we learn from that? And how can we um, help all communities, but especially the Black community in really finding some sort of relief yeah. while dealing with these things? Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of racial justice, particularly in the healthcare system, um, I think practitioners will need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, particularly when it comes to challenging their implicit bias. Um, and as Melanie was talking about, you know, how most of her practitioners who are Black still were brushing her off, that is still a form of implicit bias, right? Because it goes back to this does not happen in Black women, so let's try to find something else. So it is really um, education, but then part of that education. So we have to also update the textbooks. I think there was a study that came out a couple of years ago that still that said that some of the textbooks still have that still have like a racial undertone to mm -hmm. how they define endometriosis. And so we need to start there. Um, challenge the implicit bias because you know when medical medical students are being trained they're being trained by these doctors that have been in the system forever and already have this implicit bias ingrained and then they pass that on so it's we need to kind of like break that cycle of the implicit bias in terms of black women's health um and so i think that will go hand in hand with the education um because again we people can be the most educated in terms of technical stuff, that implicit bias, that internalized, whatever you want to call it, is still very, is still very strong and, and still very powerful and can also cause people to make uh, decisions that might not necessarily have been made if, you know, the person did not have that implicit bias or at least recognized it and, and really tried to steps in place to ensure that the implicit bias was not part of the um, their the internal system in decision making. So that's why I will add there. Yeah, love it. All great points. I also I with the education with the doctors. I think that that I'm I'm gonna agree um, with Julia as well. Um, it, the textbooks from 10, 15 years ago is is not the same now. You know. Um, uh, and I find it, I think it's very important that some of these um, medications that the doctors are putting us on, they need to, um, and that's one of the things with Katasha, my, um, my brand, I, I really would like to teach some of these women, you know, like, even if you are on these types of medications, you need to have your doctor follow up with this, with mm -hmm. blood work. Mm -hmm. with doing certain tests because my sister-in-law even though she didn't have endometriosis but I, I um she had the fibroids and fibroids you bleed a ton endometriosis as well but with her she had she was bleeding a ton with her fibroids and they put her on a medication to clot her blood mm -hmm. and the doctor wasn't following up with that he wasn't following up with that. She wasn't following up with that. Her doctor was a she. She wasn't following up with that. And what ended up happening is even though they were trying to reduce the amount of blood that she was using, she ended up developing a clot and that clot traveled to her lung and killed her. Yeah. So I find it very important that even if the doctor is going to be, well, it's not acceptable. I shouldn't even say that they should, these are things that they should know. If you're going to put me on these types of medications, you need to be following up with blood work with the pop, with the proper care. So these things don't happen. And I also really would like to push teaching women this, whether you go the holistic route or you go Western medicine and you're on medication, because I feel like my sister could have been here if she wasn't neglected by the healthcare system. Yeah. So education is definitely key when it comes on to the doctors. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Go ahead. I do also feel like the doctors are very overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> there are so few doctors that truly understand endometriosis, PCOS, fibroids. So it's almost like a factory where it's like, see one patient on to the next, like, and they don't make the time to, to follow up. Um, because they're just so trying to get people in and out that they're, they're backlogged and they're stressed. Um, so I think that also another piece of it or another component is having more doctors go into those specialties and really want to help women who deal with pelvic issues like that that's also a big piece of it right right and I honestly feel like us telling our story and continuing to be a beacon for this community will hopefully inspire the doctors and practitioners coming up to want to specialize in this field and learn more about this and want to be a help and a contributor to this disease because honestly if we could go back in time and I knew what I was going through was what I was going through I would have probably chose a different path and I would have been like, oh, I'm going to be an endo specialist because I got to help my people out. You know what I mean? But honestly, think that like spaces like this hopefully will inspire the next generation to want to learn more about it and be the help that we need for sure. We do have one question before we wrap up. It comes from Miss McCain and she wanted to ask um, for each of you or anyone, is surgery the best action for endometriosis because she can't live with this pain anymore that she's going through? So I know a few of you spoke about having surgery. I myself have had three surgeries in regards to endometriosis. And for me, it's brought me relief. Um, don't want to get caught on anymore, even though they tell me I have to have another surgery. We're going to rebuke that. But for your experience, um, was that the best action for dealing for your endometriosis or how you found another resolution for dealing with it? For me, the surgery helped a great deal. I mean, um, changing my diet and trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle did help, but the surgery was one of the best yeah. uh, treatments for me. I was, I was personally in remission for about seven years until last month. I don't know what the hell happened, but <laughs> up until last month where I um, had an exacerbation of the disease. So surgery has been the best for me. Um, I would advise you though, because um, some of these doctors or some of these surgeons don't specialize in um, endometriosis. So they could just be cleaning up the surface um, when they're doing your surgery and you get no relief. So you really want to make sure that you are doing your, um, your research, um, and get a doctor that has done these surgeries before so they can actually cut the disease out, um, to prevent some relief. Correct. Anyone else? So, I think that surgery is a personal decision and you have to be mentally and physically ready to take on that journey, right? Because it's not just surgery, it's surgery and it's six to eight weeks of recovery um, where you literally have to do. <laughs> um, I laugh because I don't know how to sit still and my doctor and I have been, I've been trying to negotiate with my doctor um, <laughs> about this upcoming surgery, which is quite funny. Um, but so for me personally, like, having the, the rupture cyst surgery and having the box surgery last year, I've had no relief. So I'm constantly in pain. I'm constantly in agony. And one thing that I know that like my family, we don't like taking pain medicine. Right. So it has to be like, I'm about to be down and out for me to take something, which by then is too late. Um, so I had to find a healthy balance with, making the decision to move forward with this surgery. Um, and really in speaking to my friends who have endo and speaking to um, some personal friends who are doctors and nurses and really just understanding what is going on with my body, um, it helped me to see that surgery is the best next first step, but there are also other things to consider, right? Diet is important. Um, I used to, I love working out. I want to get back to like that piece of me that that has been missing. Um, but it, it really is a personal decision. 
Um, and you have to, again, as Natasha was saying, you have to truly, you have to find a specialist, like, and don't let them just have it on their website. Like you need to grill them with questions. You need to make sure that you have a deep level of understanding and y'all are in agreement of, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, and make sure that the proof is in the pudding, ask the right questions and you'll know if they, they know what endo is or not and if to move forward with them or not. Great advice. I'm just going to second everything Melanie said, because that's literally what I was thinking too. I am a strong um, believer in different strokes or different folks. Everything doesn't work for everyone. And it's important for you to know what works for you in your situation, in your context. And it's similar for surgery. That is, that is definitely a very personal decision. Um, I would say for me, so my surgery was just diagnostic. Um, and I've tried other things, um, mostly um, pharmaceutical um, interventions to manage my endometriosis and they've worked, but then they're the side effects. Yeah. And so we also have to consider, you know, again, what, what is it? Because there, there's always going to be that negotiation with whatever approach you're taking no matter what so it really is for you to ask questions um go to reputable sources ensure if you are going to um pursue the surgery route like my other panelists co-panelists have said you know make sure that the, the the practitioner has experience and has you know that track record of, of success as much as possible and then, you know, again, think of the other options because this is this is going to be a, a, a path of management. And so what other uh, approaches can you integrate into your, your lifestyle that will help managing the pain as, as easy as possible for you? So that's that's my two cents there. Yeah. Definitely agree with everything that you guys have said. Um, and at the end of the day, research, 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 advocate, advocate, advocate. Don't ever feel like you're doing too much. Don't ever feel like you're being that crazy black woman, whatever it is, because you only have one body. You have one life and we all want relief. We all want health. Um, and you know what I found that also helps me is I feel like we get so much negative feedback. We get so much, can you have babies? Um, when you're going to have babies? Uh, you know, it's just so much negative things that we have. But what I continually tell myself is that I'm healthy and that I will continue to be healthy. And I feel like if we have that mindset and we just push that out and purposely put it on people, <laughs> we will we will seek the help um, that we need. And like we've all said, just continue to do your research, journal, advocate for yourself, um, be that voice for yourself. And I pray that we all receive relief and the help that we so very much deserve and need. And um, we don't have any more questions. It is eight o'clock. So I'm going to pass it over to Lauren for her to close. But I want to thank all of you ladies for just being transparent, um, being authentic and allowing um, us to, to be in the space with you and to hear your stories and to hear your advice and just sharing your your um, experience with us. It is not taken for granted. Um, I love all of you ladies. Um, I, all of you ladies inspire me. And Lauren, as always, thank you for having me and allowing us this platform um, to just come and connect, learn, and just do better for our community. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I just wanna say thank you um, to you all for those who attended the event. And for those who have participated, sharing so much insight, um, wisdom, and education is, is key, as you know, you all have said numerous times. So I'm just really grateful and ha happy to have an opportunity to, you know, have this virtual conversation, um, to do all of these different things. I'm just so excited to have so much support from the community. Um, and this is going to be, as I mentioned, when we first started our last virtual event, um, it has been an amazing opportunity since 2022 when we started 
and really just allowing women the opportunity to cope with the pandemic, to have a safe space, to have an opportunity to learn how to manage their endometriosis pain, um, how endometriosis affects uh, your relationship, how to manage healthy sex, how to have a, a wonderful endo diet. There are so many topics that we've discussed over the years, and I'm just so, so grateful to everybody who has participated, who has watched, who has supported, and who has really just taken the moment to really, really understand what endometriosis is like. Um, there are people who attend the event who don't have endometriosis, and I'm really grateful for that as well because we have those people who are trying or who are listening who want to do better. So it's really great. Um, as I said, this is our last virtual event, so I'm thankful. Um, before we sign off, I definitely want to let you all know if you are in the DMV area, we are going to have a volunteer day on January the 8th and January. I'm sorry. On J it's the J. It's the J. We're gonna have <laughs> we're gonna have the event on June the 28th and 29th. We will be packing period care kits. If you are able to attend, please check out our press release on our website, on the blog page, just to get more information about that. Also, we have a lot of great things coming up. Um, our war gala is October the 14th. If you are interested in nominating someone, maybe somebody that is on this panel, feel free to go ahead and do that. Head over to our website as well on our blog post to look at our press release. Again, thank you so much. Everyone have a great evening. Um, we will continue to engage, educate, and also in, encourage Indo sisters everywhere. Thank you.